All right, friends, I see we're, we're getting up there in numbers, so I think we'll begin. Uh, to all who have gathered on our webinar, all the participants, it's my real pleasure today to welcome you to this, the third webinar in what has been a truly edifying three-part series uh, titled, as you see, uh, Steeled in Adversity, Jews and the History of Health Crises in America. Now, more than a decade ago, the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives became a pioneer when it began to offer these periodic webinars on various facets of American Jewish history. Uh, these online learning sessions are intended to benefit the alumni of HUCJIR, our school's benefactors, and of course, all those who are devotees of American Jewish history. The webinars offer us another opportunity to fulfill the mandate bequeathed to us from the AJA's founder and namesake, Jacob Rader Marcus, and that is to preserve and to promulgate the history of the Jewish experience in North America. Now it's very fitting that this final webinar takes place on Lag Omer, the 33rd day of the counting that carries us from Passover to Shavuot. And some know there's, there exists a medieval uh, Jewish belief that a cruel plague that had caused thousands of Torah scholars to perish in the days of Rabbi Akiva ended miraculously on Lagba Omer, the 33rd day of the counting. And I hope I'm speaking for everyone when I say that in this one case, I think we would all like to see history repeat itself. Now, with the onset of the pandemic, uh, many people have been very eager to learn more about the public health challenges that our American Jewish predecessors faced over the course of our own history. Did our forebears here in the New World face anything comparable to the circumstances that have overwhelmed us in this first half of 2020? So this special three-part webinar series constitutes, as I say, our effort to address these questions. And the learning sessions remind us, as we have seen over the past two sessions, that history does not repeat itself, but the past does echo forward in time. And we are perceiving through these webinar sessions uh, echoes of the past. By the way, our medieval forebears also framed Lag Omer as what they called a scholar's day, a, a day for rabbinical students to celebrate. So the AJA is very proud to mark this Lag Omer by providing you with your own special scholar day, which is a day on which, uh, which we're going to feature two outstanding alumni of the Hebrew Union College two rabbis and scholars of the American Jewish experience, one from the class of 1980, Rabbi Lance J. Sussman, who is the senior rabbi of Knesset Israel in Philadelphia, and the other from the class of 2019, Rabbi Bailey Romano, the educator at Bethel Hebrew Congregation in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, before Dr. Sussman is introduced by Rabbi Peter Berg, uh, and we're able to begin delving into our topic for this afternoon, let me now give you some technical information about the webinar itself. At any point during this webinar, you will be able to type in questions that you may have into your chat box, which is at this, uh, somewhere on the screen, and uh, your questions will be seen by us, the panelists, but not by the other participants. And in light of the very large number of attendees who are joining us this afternoon, it is almost a certainty that we will not be able to answer all of the questions that come in over the hour. But 
we will do our best to address at least a few questions towards the end of our seminar. And if there are unanswered questions, I know that Dr. Sussman and Rabbi Romano will be very happy to answer them by email, uh, which uh, you'll have at the end of the webinar session. Please remember that all of us, all of us on the panel, will be more than happy to help or advise you if you are planning to teach any of this material in your own Medinot, in your own areas in the weeks ahead. On your screen, as you can see, you'll be able to not only see the teachers, but also the documents and the photos that relate to this afternoon's session. And at the conclusion of this webinar, I will make a few brief announcements. So hope you'll remain with us for the entire hour. 24 hours after this webinar concludes, you all will be receiving a follow-up mailing that will give you a URL where you'll be able to download everything that you've seen on the screen today, the study packets, just as they've been prepared for you by the AJA. And we hope you'll want to use them when you study this topic or when you even decide to teach it for yourself. And if you want a recording of this webinar, uh, together with an array of other special learning programs that have been sponsored by the College Institute, please go to the HUC's special learning portal, which is easy enough, huc.edu backslash online learning. Now, it is my genuine honor and really a privilege for me to call upon my friend, our colleague, Rabbi Peter Berg. Uh, I think he's known to almost all of us, in addition to being an outstanding figure in the Atlanta area and for our movement in general, uh, Peter also makes time to serve as the vice chair of a special group of HUC JIR alumni. This group is called the B'nai Yaakov Council. And the B'nai Yaakov Council is composed of nearly 100 HUCJIR alumni who are the loyal supporters, partisans, if you will, of the AJA. And you know that the AJA is today the largest freestanding archival research center dedicated solely to the study of the American Jewish experience. And it is not an exaggeration, though I am given to exaggerations, to say that the AJA's unprecedented growth over the years since its founding in 1947 is very much due to the boundless support that it has received from HUCJIR alumni. And the members of the B'nai Yaakov Council lead the way in perpetuating this important tradition of alumni support and encouragement for the work of the AJA. A bit later, I will be introducing Rabbi Romano, but now it is my pleasure to call upon Rabbi Berg, who will introduce to you Rabbi Dr. Lance Sussman. Thank you, Gary. Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. So good to be with you. When Gary first called me about saying a few words and I saw his name on the cell phone, I instinctively ran to grab my checkbook. <laughs> and I, of course, should have known and remembered that the annual AJA appeal comes not by phone, but by U.S. mail with a great joke and incredible insight into American Jewish history. Gary, thank you so much for bringing us together today. Thank you for being our friend. And thank you by word and deed for making this world a better place every single day. I have been blessed over the last few years to work with uh, Micah Greenstein and Sally Prezand in the leadership of the B'nai Yaakov Council of the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives. And all of us on this call know that there are committee assignments that are arduous and there are committee assignments that are truly a pleasure. Serving as a vice chair of the B'nai Yaakov Council is one of the great joys and privileges in my rabbinate. The B'nai Yaakov Council members serve, of course, in an advisory capacity on a, a wide variety of issues, including the center's programming, which you all know is absolutely outstanding, the prominent role that the center holds in our reform movement, its relationship with the CCAR and uh, uh, HUC, and of course, all of the movement's affiliates. Uh, we who serve are truly dedicated to keeping alive the teachings of Dr. Marcus, 
but also to propelling forward Dr. Zola's ambitious mission. We are champions of promoting the resources of the AJA far and wide, and we believe in teaching American Jewish history to the next generation as an enduring and central component of our revenants. Colleagues and friends, thank you for being here today to learn from two exceptional teachers, and thank you for your support of one of our movement's greatest treasures. Gary, even though you didn't ask, or maybe because you didn't ask, I'm making an extra gift today. Oh. <laughs> it is my special pleasure now to introduce our first speaker, Rabbi Lance Sussman. Dr. Sussman is a native of Baltimore, Maryland, who serves as senior rabbi of Reform Congregation, Knesset Israel of Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. And he has served in that position since the year 2001. Previously as the rabbi of Temple Concord in uh, Binghamton, New York, and an associate professor of Jewish history at Binghamton University. Lance has also taught at Princeton, at Hunter College, at Rutgers. He's chair of the Board of Governors of Gratz College and an honorary trustee of Delaware Valley University. Many of you know Lance as a specialist in the field of American Jewish history. You've read his articles, you've seen him teach, and he has written many, many books and numerous articles on the American Jewish experience. Currently, he's working on a television documentary on the history of the Philadelphia Jewish community, and he's editing a collection of his sermons and essays. You will soon see why Lance Sussman is the perfect presenter for our program today on Jews and the history of communal health crises in America. Friends, please welcome our teacher, Rabbi Lance Sussman. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gary, for inviting me. Um, just meeting Bailey for the first time. It's a real pleasure. And I want to give a call out to two people at the archives that you don't see up there, uh, Lisa and Dana, uh, for all of our colleagues. Uh, if you ever need information from the American Jewish Archives for your own research or for a program at your synagogue or wherever you work, uh, AJA will leap into action and you will have that information as fast or faster than humanly possible. And I urge you to use this resource. It is really a wonderful, uh, a wonderful uh, source of information and support for all of us. I use it all the time. Uh, my talk is going to uh, focus on the yellow fever in, uh, in Philadelphia in 1793. I understand as part of this series, uh, there were other talks on yellow fevers. Uh, this is an early yellow fever epidemic uh, that hit the uh, then largest city in the United States, Philadelphia, which had 50,000 people. 10% of uh, all the people in Philadelphia died from it. That is about 5,000 people died from it. Uh, they did not really have a medical theory to deal with it. They did not have a, a doctrine of social distancing, although it was typical of people of uh, means to flee the city. Uh, it was more of an epidemic than a pandemic. It was highly uh, localized, and by fleeing the city, they uh, inadvertently but correctly uh, helped, contain, uh, helped contain this epidemic, which was a major one in early American history. It did have a major impact on the local Jewish community as we're about to see as well, in particular as it did on the uh, African-American community as well. Then go to the next slide. And I think Gary is our operator here. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay. So uh, here's a dramatic picture uh, from one of the river wards of Philadelphia. Uh, people literally were dying in the, in the streets from it. Uh, and I call it almost forgotten for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, we tend not to teach medical history in the curriculum of our public and private schools, even colleges in the United States. Uh, I, the most terrifying example of that was the flu epidemic of 1918. Approximately 165,000 American soldiers died in World War I. Um, 
but over 650,000 people died in the flu epidemic in 1918 stateside. And yet rarely do we ever hear about the Spanish flu, but we do hear a little bit at least about World War I. So in that sense, it's almost forgotten. I also am calling it almost forgotten because the principal uh, Jewish figure in this was also almost forgotten several times and only recently received his historical due with a proper monument to his service during the Revolutionary War. Next slide, please. So later on, you'll have time to uh, go back and uh, read some of these uh, notes. Uh, this is something I wrote as a summary of the yellow fever. There were waves of yellow fevers, cholera, smallpox. There was no inoculation yet. There were no treatment plans. And when these things hit, whether they were in America, back in Europe, or anywhere on the planet, uh, they tended to have uh, devastating effects. Um, we know that there was confusion uh, in the community. Uh, they didn't understand the origins of it. It was hard to gather um, statistics. We know that both class and race play a major role in defining uh, the mortality uh, of those who uh, fall as a result of the yellow fever. Uh, and just as we see today, uh, government was forced to open up potter's fields and bury people in trenches without markers because of the great risk of further infection to the rest of the population. Next slide. Okay, here is a map of Philadelphia at the time. Uh, it is uh, a seafront town on the Delaware River along Front Street. Although William Penn had planned out a full city that all went all the way to the Schuylkill, uh, Philadelphia was still a pedestrian city, only a couple blocks wide at its largest point, but it had a very condensed population, which meant that the spread of the disease could uh, occur rapidly. Uh, this is a map that's been reconstructed by scholars showing you where uh, the epidemic had the highest uh, mortality uh, rate. The city had 50,000 people, which made it the largest city in, in the United States, although it was only a fraction of what downtown Philadelphia is today. The city and county did not amalgamate until uh, the 1850s. The Jewish community actually lived uh, in the area, I think that you can see visually, where they had the highest casualty rates, but because the community was overall middle class, it was a community of shopkeepers, uh, they were able to successfully flee. And we only know of about a half a dozen Jews among the 5,000 who actually die, although the impact, as we'll see, was much greater than that. Next slide. Okay. Now here is an example of confusion uh, at, at a number of different levels. Um, Philadelphia, uh, after the revolution, was the largest Jewish city in the United States. Uh, Jews from both New York and Charleston had fled to Philadelphia during the war, uh, bringing its Jewish population up to about a thousand. So a thousand out of 50,000 were Jewish, would made it the largest Jewish city uh, in the country, the largest community. Uh, there was not institutional growth as well. Curiously, within that population of a thousand people, there were two men by the same name. They both were named David Franks, but they could not have been more different than one another. One was older and wealthier. The other was younger, poorer. The older one uh, proved to be a loyalist, although he had signed the protest against the Non-Importation Acts of 1765, and the younger had uh, joined uh, Washington's army and became uh, an officer. 
Um, this article here comes from the old Jewish encyclopedia, which is now completely online. And I added a picture of his beautiful home, which is now a national monument, and you can visit to see how uh, upper class American Jews lived during the colonial and uh, uh, early national period. Uh, and for decades, it was believed that this David Franks had perished during the uh, epidemic, but in fact, he probably had gone to England. He was a loyalist and died there the following year. Uh, one of the tricks in recon reconstructing history in general and history from a period like early national is verification. And because the names are the same, the assumption was that both men by the name of David Franks died in the epidemic. So the first lesson here is really that of caution in trying to determine facts. And we certainly can tell by following our own encounter with COVID-19, determining the facts is not necessarily easy. Uh, it's not easy in any event, but particularly in the middle of a pandemic. Next slide. Okay. The David Franks who did die from the uh, yellow fever was David S. Franks, who was born in Philadelphia in 1740. He was bar mitzvah at Mikveh Israel, the only synagogue, the Sephardi, mostly Portuguese synagogue, which had become mostly Ashkenazic not long after its founding. Uh, he was from a, uh, a Sephardic family that was French speaking, and he got it in his head uh, as a young man that he would go to Canada to make his fortune and join the American forces there uh, and fought on the American side at the Battle of Quebec, which of course the Americans lost. He then made his way back to his hometown of Philadelphia, where he served with the officers when Philadelphia was under military control after the British had left in 1777. His misfortune was that his commanding officer was Benedict Arnold, and he never really got out from that association Although George Washington on several times granted him amnesty, it just didn't work and he couldn't get his life back together again. And in fact, he was largely shunned by the Jewish community. And as we will see, that had tragic consequences. Um, unable to operate on the field in the military because of his uh, work with Benedict Arnold, he was sent as an American attache to Paris and took the American terms of peace over to the French capital. When he came back, though, he was unable to get his life in order. He did work for the U.S. Bank. He did perish in October of 1793, perhaps the most famous of the American Jewish casualties of the yellow fever of 1793, as we will see why. Next slide, please. We learn about um, Major David Salisbury Franks from none other than Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was a signer of the Declaration of uh, Independence, uh, who was the leading medical authority in all of the United States, not only Philadelphia at the time. And although he had an opportunity to flee the city uh, and join his family in nearby Princeton, New Jersey, uh, he stayed by to treat the sick in Philadelphia. Nearly every day during the worst of the epidemic, he wrote letters of his activity to his wife, Julia, who was in Princeton. Her last name was Stockton, and her father was a signer of the Declaration, Richard Stockton. Uh, you can tell from their correspondence that they were quite familiar with the local Jewish community. We move to the next slide. So here is uh, what the actual letter looks like, and I thank the archives for tracking down the original hand. Uh, deciphering um, this kind of uh, original writing is not always easy, but however, this has all been done and published. So uh, for the most part, it's uh, not too difficult dealing with the literature. Uh, this is from a letter written by the, the leading doctor in Philadelphia uh, to his wife on October the 7th, and I'll just read the top paragraph. 
Among the dead this day are Mrs. Colton, who was a midwife, I inserted that, and Major D. Franks, and then I insert what his work was because it's significant. At the time, he was an assistant cashier of the Bank of the USA. The former, that is David Franks, died without a physician, not believing, believing himself uh, uh, to be, uh, in fact, that, that she did it. The latter, uh, which is Dr. Dr. Major Franks, died at Mr. Keene's, who was an assistant cashier, under the care of a French physician. And that's important because Benjamin Rush hated all French physicians. And the, the one Jewish doctor in town at the time was a French-speaking doctor. Major Franks had been deserted by all of his friends, and that is because of his association with Benedict Arnold. And it is said that he was buried in a potter's field. Upwards of a hundred people, more it is said, were conveyed to the grave on that single day on October the 7th, 1793, which is reminiscent of what we just went through uh, here in New York City. Next, next uh, letter from Dr. Rush. So this is what the next letter actually looks like. When you get the pamphlets, you'll be able to try your own uh, attempts at, uh, at reading it. So when we get to the transcript, uh, I was very surprised that when I read the next day, uh, in the official translation provided by Google Books, our main authority in American history these days, there was no reference whatsoever to Major Franks. But there was a PS to the letter, which I deciphered myself. And it reads the following. Major Franks was not, underlined, buried in Potter's Field. Honest John Thompson, the blacksmith with the wooden leg, who lives opposite to Mrs. K, undecipherable, prevented it and obtained a grave for him in the Christ Church burying ground, which I will tell you is where he remains to this day. So the initial information about David Franks was wrong. Uh, his body was on a cart that was taking him to a potter's field, but an average citizen from the blue collar noticed that a hero of the American Revolution was being conveyed to a potter's grave, which would be unmarked. And he personally intervened and made sure that the largest church in town, the Anglican Episcopal Church, would give him a burial. And today there is an honorary monument about three graves east of Benjamin Franklin, where Major Franks was buried for his service in the army, particularly in the Battle of, uh, of Quebec. What is important here uh, is the fact that Jews and non-Jews were clearly interacting with one another and that the non-Jewish population understood who was who in the Jewish community and it offended the sensibility, ascended the uh, sensibilities of a blacksmith that an army officer, despite the fact that he was Jewish, was not being given a proper burial. And this is how we learned about Major Franks. And about 10 years ago, a group of us in Philadelphia got together and we made sure a proper marker was put on, uh, on where he approximately was buried. It was a plague and we didn't have full information. Next slide. Okay. Now in town at the time, uh, was uh, a Jewish doctor from Suriname whose name was David de Isaac Kohen Nasi. Uh, he had come the year before. He was French speaking. Uh, he was one of the doctors that uh, Benjamin Rush had nothing but uh, disgust for, did not agree with Rush's treatment. Now, Rush was actually the one who was wrong because he used the then conventional means of basically just bleeding people to get, quote, rid of the bad blood. Uh, Rush felt that the, um, the yellow fever had been caused by a bad shipment of coffee and fish from the Caribbean, and that's by bleeding uh, the people affected by the fever uh, he could cure them. He was not able to cure them. 
uh, Isaac Cohen de Nasi, Nasi uh, believed in much lighter treatment without as much bleeding and including fresh air and simple hydration. Uh, it says here that of his 117 patients, he was able to save 98. What is significant about this document, observations on the cause and nature and treatment of the epidemic disorder prevalent in Philadelphia, is that this is the first medical treatise ever written by a Jew in the United States of America. There were other doctors, but this is the first time. And what precipitated it was a kind of self-defense against the relentless attacks uh, by Dr. Rush against these French um, uh, doctors who actually had experience with yellow fever in the islands. And in fact, it did come from the islands, although none of them understood that it was really conveyed by mosquitoes. Now, in this case, once the weather did turn cool, the epidemic itself did uh, end because the mosquitoes all died and it no longer spread among the population. So the book itself, if we go to the next slide, I want to move quickly because I know Bailey wants to talk, um, is uh, written uh, just like Mishkan Tefillah. It's uh, a two-page sp spread. And in this case, on the right page is the English text, and on the left side is the, uh, is the left text. And you can read a little bit about uh, the things that he did um, that he treated adults differently than he treated um, children, that he held back on the bleeding and where necessary, uh, he used an opium compound to relieve uh, pain. He did not use such things as bark, which was one of the things that uh, Dr. Rush made a big case about, that it was the wrong treatment. Okay, we can go to the next slide. And here is another one of uh, some of the mixes that he came up with. It really borders on uh, folk medicine. Okay. okay. Now, how did they do inside of the uh, Jewish community? We know that Major Franks was one of the victims. Uh, some of you may recall a great story about the Grand Federal Parade in Philadelphia in 1788. This gigantic mural, it must be 30 or 40 feet high, is actually in the parking garage uh, underneath Independence Hall. And I think almost nobody knows about it, but it is possible that one of the clergy standing in the line there is Rabbi Jacob Cohn, because when the Constitution was ratified, Philadelphia had a big parade and it was led by the clergy, Jewish, Protestant, Catholic, walking arm in arm at the front of the parade. Really magnificent expression of interfaith. One of the things scholars are not sure is if the one free black minister in town, Richard Allen, participated. So they have him standing sort of alone facing the rest of the clergy because it's a question mark as to whether or not he was there. And because it's in the parking garage, there's a painting actually of a young dad who's a tourist holding his child looking back into Philadelphia uh, history. So Jacob Cohn was the rabbi of Mikveh Israel. He might be the third person in from the right, but the figures are actually not identified by the art, uh, artist. Now, we know something about the way uh, Rabbi Cohen uh, behaved during uh, the epidemic. So we go to the next slide. This is a letter written by Samuel Hayes to Risha Gratz, uh, who was the uh, one of the older sisters of Rebecca uh, Gratz, uh, and had she had gone to Lancaster where she grew up. She herself, by the way, was the first Jew American Jewish woman to go to college. She went to Franklin and Marshall. Uh, college in Lancaster, where I, where I happen to go to school. And here, her husband is writing to her about the behavior of the rabbi during the epidemic. So if any of you think that your congregation is not paying attention to how you are handling yourselves during this pandemic, take note of this letter. Uh, Samuel Hayes, his brother, uh, went on to found the Great Will's Eye Clinic, writes, 
our worthy pastor, that is Rabbi Cohn, is not yet returned November 27 and does not come till next week. He has sent the children down to air the house. That is, he went up to Easton, Pennsylvania and didn't even come home to check the house he sent his kids. He, like other persons of his cloth, gives precepts that they don't mean to follow. One afternoon, he was at Jonas Phillips's house, who was the uh, Parnas of Mikveh Israel, and he preached for half an hour during the pandemic to put their trust in the Almighty, that there was no such thing as flying from his hand that is fleeing from God like the book of Jonah, though he, though, though he God, would protect those who put his trust in him. And that he, Rabbi Cohn, meant to stay in town, which made Mr. Phillips conclude to do the same. Uh, Phillips is the Parnas of Mikvah Israel. When behold, the first thing that Mr. Phillips heard the next morning was that Rabbi Cohn, with all of his morality, had flown and left the congregation to put their trust in that being himself put no faith in. Mayor Hart, who received him in Easton, was a great admirer of Rabbi Cohn and took him in. So it is a letter uh, by the Hayes, uh, Mr. Hayes, who was not an admirer of the rabbi, basically accusing the rabbi of uh, hypocrisy. So this letter, uh, I don't know if the original is still extant, but if we go to the next slide, Back in 47, when Dr. Marcus founded the archives, he toured the country, and in those days, Xerox technology produced uh, reverse uh, images, so it's black paper with white writing, and uh, luckily, he took this picture uh, of this letter by Hayes, because subsequently, uh, the Dropsy College, like JTS, burned down and many of these were lost. Uh, what was saved is now at the University of Pennsylvania. Okay, we're almost done. If we go to the next, I'm going to go very quickly. I'm not going to read the documents. Uh, this was written, if you see, uh, A.J. Absalom Jonas and R.A. Richard Allen. Uh, Richard Allen, in particular, was the uh, founder uh, he was the founder of the first free black church in America, which is known as AME Mother Bethel Church. And interestingly, Dr. Rush, the leading doctor in the town, uh, believed that black people were immune to uh, the yellow fever. So he called upon them to be the nurses, nurses and the porters and caretakers of the white population. In fact, they had no special immunity and they died in just as great numbers, about 300. But during the course of the, uh, of the epidemic, uh, a newspaper man in town by the name of Matthew Carey uh, said, although he wants to thank the black population, for taking care of the sick. In fact, they are spreading the disease even farther, which is not true. It was the mosquito that was uh, doing it. So racism played a very clear role here, and we know that race and class are affecting what is happening today. So if we go to the next slide, very quickly, you'll just get a sense of what the narrative of Richard Allen looks like. If you ever come to Philly, please visit the AME Mother Bethel church. It's the first free black church in America. And finally, because I know Bailey is eager to give her presentation, and we skip to Gary. You can see some of the things. Uh, we do not have a report from an American Jewish woman at the time, but I did want to have a woman's perspective on what it was like to be in Philadelphia in 1793. And the best place to turn is to the amazing diary of Elizabeth uh, Sandwith Drinker, who was a Quaker woman, uh, who kept a diary for over 40 years. It is 2,100 pages long. It is the longest document by a woman in colonial and early American uh, history. And she has a daily account of of the uh, plague here in Philadelphia in 1793. We can go to her letters to conclude. So here is what the published versions. I don't know if the complete one has ever been 
put out at all 2,100 pages, but significant excerpts. She lived at the far end of Philadelphia, all the way over by the Schuylkill River and what's now called Grace Ferry. So very quickly, we go to the last picture now. You can see she kept it for 40 years. I just want to read this last entry to get a sense of the tragedy of the moment. Uh, September 29 is a Sunday. Uh, Mr. Pemberton called in meeting time. They're Quakers. Uh, Mrs. De Mrs. Pemberton, she wished me to go with her to Jacob Spicer, a Sunday visit. We went. She agreed with them to remove tomorrow to their house out of her own. Then we met somebody else. He informed us of the death of Samuel Powell, uh, who's the a mayor of the city, but said that it was hoped that the disorder was lessened as there was but one person buried yesterday in Friends Burying Ground. Friends meaning Quaker. Same way today, we're up. The numbers are up one day, down one day, and we're always speculating what it means. Our people heard after the meeting of the deaths of Sam Parker's wife, Josephine Bisham, a hatter, a daughter of Owen Biddle, a distinguished family. Elston Perot buried his youngest child, the son, this morning in the German town burying ground. It was not supposed he died of the yellow fever, although it's unsure. His family are in town near the water at Samson Place called Par La Ville. It's part of that French speaking community. And then this terrible line this is the fourth child out of five that have, they have lost that one family within three years. Two sons of putrid throat, not having a, an actual name, and a little daughter was also overlaid by her nurse. They now have but one daughter. <laughs> remaining in the middle of this terrible epidemic. So that's an insight, I hope, a window uh, into what the epidemic of 1793 uh, looked like in Philadelphia, monstrous in scale, 5,000 out of 50,000 died, including a famous Jewish officer. It also precipitated the first Jewish medical treatise written in the United States. Thank you for your attention. Well, I, um, let's see here, there we are. Uh, I wanna uh, thank you, uh, Rabbi Sussman. Uh, I know uh, I can just uh, feel the uh, 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 sentiments that are coming through from the almost 250 people who've been listening to you that uh, it, it, we're so fortunate to have you as a teacher today and I really thank you. Um, and and uh, with the, in the last uh, a quarter hour, I want to introduce our second teacher, Rabbi Bailey Romano, who is currently uh, serving as the education director at Bethel Hebrew Congregation in Alexandria, Virginia. Now, Rabbi Romano was raised in Slidell, Louisiana, and she's a graduate of Rhodes College in Memphis. And prior to her studies, uh, rabbinical studies, she came to the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati to earn a master's degree in Judaic studies from the Pines School of Graduate Studies. And that's when she really began to fall in love with American Jewish history. And so when she was uh, in rabbinical school and as she was completing it, she decided to do her rabbinical thesis on American Jewish history and the topic of her very fine thesis is Rabbinical Responses to Select Epidemics and Natural Disasters in American Jewish History. And this thesis, written just a year ago, has serendipitously transformed Rabbi Romano into something of an expert for the challenging times we are all currently facing, at least in terms of how rabbinic religious leaders uh, face those days. So we are so pleased that he has agreed to share some of her knowledge that she learned from her thesis. Uh, with us today, Rabbi Romano, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Zola. It is an honor to, to be here and I'm so grateful to have learned um, from Dr. Sussman as well. American rabbis today, like in generations past, are being forced to respond to the impossible circumstances imposed upon them by natural disasters and epidemics at an unprecedented rate. After all, we are seeing this in real time 
as we as Jewish clergy and laity seek to address the physical, emotional, and spiritual needs of our communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. Jacob Borsanger and Henry Cohen lived through natural disasters that left an indelible mark on the history of their rabbinates. There are certain recurring themes in their biographies and styles of leadership that can help us to respond to our present crisis as well as crises in the future. Both men were resilient, adaptable, and able to navigate an expansion of their roles beyond the typical responsibilities of a pulpit rabbi. As you will see here and as my thesis presents, the American rabbinical response to epidemics and disasters was historically and even currently typified by a rabbi's attention to pastoral care, fundraising, and organizational and civic leadership. Disaster history is a relatively new historical field that began in Europe in the 1980s and emerged out of the fields of environmental and urban history. My work seeks to add to the emerging fields of disaster history while integrating its theories and findings into the study of American Jewish history. Disasters prompt a reshaping of an individual and a community's worldview. While addressing their own struggles in this theological or, or ideological space, rabbis must address one of the most profound areas affected by disaster, the destabilizing and deconstruction of meaning. Through their interactions with congregants, writings, and sermons, rabbis set the stage for personal and communal reconstruction of meaning. Before diving into our documents and describing Borsinger and Cohen, I'd like to pick up where Dr. Sussman left off. Yellow fever epidemics in particular played a significant role in the shaping of the American Jewish experience also in the South in the 19th century. In 1853 alone, approximately 8,000 to 15,000 citizens of the city of New Orleans were killed by the disease and over 100 Jews perished. Rabbi James K. Gutheen was integral to the pastoral and communal response to the epidemic. Yellow fever outbreaks specifically in New Orleans and later in Memphis in 1873 and 1878 as Dr. Sussman um, writes about in his articles and in his work, prompted the establishment of homes for widows and orphans, Jewish benevolent, benevolent associations, and empowered rabbis to pursue funds via networks established by B'nai B'rith and Jewish newspapers like Isaac Meyerweise's The American Israelite. Cohen and Borsinger were able to follow Guthim and Max Samfield's of Memphis models of crisis leadership while leaning on the networks created from their previous experiences with epidemics in the 19th century. Rabbi Jacob Borsanger was one of the leading rabbis in San Francisco in 1906. Borsanger utilized his role as a rabbi to address the immediate and long-term challenges wrought by the earthquake and fire. He demonstrated civic leadership by working with the mayor and other leaders to bring order out of chaos by providing food and water to San Francisco citizens. With the immediate needs of the city met, his attention turned to rebuilding his synagogue and San Francisco's Jewish institutions and communicating with Jewish newspapers and organizations that could come to their aid. When funds were not distributed to the Jewish community of San Francisco in a timely manner, Worsinger and other rabbis <clears throat> began writing articles to appeal to Jews, both nationally and internationally, to provide for the healing community. Worsinger died at the Hotel de Monte in Monterey, California on April 27, 1908. His death is attributed to the intense stress brought about by the ongoing recovery and rebuilding efforts in San Francisco, which sent him to the East Coast and to Europe to secure funds for the Jewish community. At the time of his death, he had served Temple Emmanuel in San Francisco for approximately 22 years. In 1906, the Jewish community of San Francisco was composed of a strong network of institutions and synagogues. In his Jewish Encyclopedia article from, from 1899, Borsinger lists six synagogues along with their leaders. At the turn of the century, there were approximately 1,600 Jews who were members of synagogues. However, the Jewish population, according to Borsinger, hovered around 16,000. On the morning of, eight, of April 18th, 1906, Temple Emanuel stood tall as one of the grandest religious buildings in San Francisco. It boasted two twin towers plated in bronze and gold rising 175 feet in the air. The synagogue's height and architecture made it a conspicuous sight along the San Francisco skyline. Less than 24 hours later, Temple Emanuel was a shell of its former self. Only the skeleton of its towers remained, its beautiful stained glass and stars of David burned and shattered. The earthquake and fire of 1906 stands as a defining moment in the history of the city of San Francisco and as a turning point in the rabbinic and national Jewish response to epidemics and disasters. According to the United States Geological Survey, the earthquake in San Francisco ranks as one of the most significant earthquakes of all time. 
According to official reports, over 28,000 buildings were destroyed, over 3,000 killed, and 225,000 were homeless. In June of 1906, two months following the earthquake and fire, Borsinger published an article in Out West, a magazine about, old, about the old and new West, relating to his relief work in the aftermath of the earthquake and fire in San Francisco. Although the article's primary goal is to recount his relief efforts, he begins the article by referring to the text of Unatana Tokef. On page 24 in our handout, we read, in the ritual of the synagogue for the new year and the day of atonement, fatalistic like all oriental rituals, there occurs a famous poem of Rabbi Amnon of Mainz, which is the quintessence of all doctrine on foreordination and predestination. On the new year it is written and on the day of atonement it is finally ordered. When the books of record are opened before almighty God that therein is written the destiny of all men who shall live and who shall die, who by fire and who by water, who by earthquake and who by pestilence. Like Rabbi Amnon of Mainz, Vorsanger's own personal experience of the quake impacted his theological response to the disaster. The text of Unatana Togef speaks to Vorsanger's experience of death and destruction in 1906. He writes, out of the terrible personal experience of this learned medieval Jew came a lesson we in San Francisco have spelled out to the very last letter of the alphabet. And we are still learning, still under the spell of the cataclysm that wiped out our past and compels us to interrogate the future. Borsinger addresses the ongoing emotional trauma caused by the earthquake and fire, which prompted a new vision for Jewish San Francisco, as well as a new understanding of God's role in the disaster. Borsinger described his own personal terror in light of the earthquake. I am not ashamed to own it. The terror of those four fifths of a minute was a common one. When we realized at last that we'd escaped the doom of death, we did not yet know what the inscrutable hand of destiny had traced for us. Borsinger describes the distinction between a crisis response to a disaster and the secondary emotional and theological processing, which only comes later. Relating to the connection between God's role and the quake and fire, Borsinger wrote on page 25, I said one hour after the earthquake that we had the advantage of all the world, for it still awaited its day of judgment, and we had ours. Grim joke, that, but the truth underlying is that Almighty God cannot, could not send us a more terrible experience than that of this quake and holocaust, desolation and impoverishment, and I make this statement in the fact of all the remarkable spirit our people have manifested. In the face of wondrous hope and courage that pervaded us all, the more remarkable because of all the awful terror that did not paralyze our energies and convert thousands of us into raving maniacs or despairing babbling idiots. According to Vorsanger, the earthquake and fire of 1906 served as a day of judgment for the people of San Francisco. He directly attributes the cataclysmic event to God's intervention in the world. For Vorsanger, the terrible experience prompted San Francisco and the Jewish community to ask deep questions about their actions in the world and how they could reform their ways. At the same time, he also gives, gives thanks to God for witnessing the power of the human spirit and the ability of human beings to join together in times of great tragedy. Towards the bottom of page 25, we read, the old prophets and rabbis in the years that separate us from them already foreshadowed the times when human nature attaining to its glorious maximum would call into existence the time of Messiah, the time of humanity made whole and by sound by its great virtues and healed from its great sorrows and afflictions. It seemed to me in the second hour of the catastrophe and in the marvelous hours that followed that God mercifully permitted me to witness the noble rise of human nature to its fullest height. For him, God causes cataclysmic events but God also enables human beings to demonstrate kindness and virtue, which enables the repair and rebuilding of societies in the wake of disaster. Regardless of the death and destruction caused by the earthquake and fire, Borsanger emphasized the power of God to unify in the wake of disaster. He writes that there was but one religion, the touch of God was upon man and out of the crumbling churches and synagogues had come the spirit of love and peace we ministered that morning to a congregation that had heard but one interpretation. I saw a cowled monk lean over an Orthodox Jew and whisper words of the tenderest comfort into his ears. Based on this statement, Borsinger understood God as a merciful and unifying judge, promoting unity in the wake of destruction. His theological response to the earthquake and fire, written two months after those harrowing events, was deeply connected to the language of Unatana Togeth and the theme of God's judgment. 
At the same time, Borsinger's words called to mind images of a merciful and compassionate a God while also alluding to the messianic age, when all people turn to God and to one another in unity. Borsinger's words provide us with a window into how rabbis faced with disasters in the generations before us sought to make meaning for themselves and for those they served. I'm going to skip ahead to Rabbi Henry Cohen so we can get a sense of, of who he was. Rabbi Henry Cohen's experience in the Galveston hurricane and flood of 1900 provides us with yet another perspective on the role of rabbis during disasters. Rabbi Henry Cohen is well known in American Jewish history as a leader of the Galveston movement, which routed Jewish immigrants, largely, largely from Eastern Europe, through the post of Galveston between the years of 1907 and 1914. Although a handful of biographies exist recounting Henry Cohen's life, including those by Jacob Rader Marcus and James Kessler, most, primary, most pro focus primarily on Cohen's life and work with the Galveston immigration movement. Biographies of Cohen rarely touch on the Galveston hurricane. In 1900, Galveston's population hovered around 38,000. In the first days and weeks following the storm, the city estimated that approximately 6,000 lives were lost. However, the final account revealed that the number was likely higher, somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000, among them 46 Jews. Essentially, overnight, nearly a quarter of the city's population perished. Rabbi Cohen's primary concern in the immediate aftermath of the hurricane was to provide safety and supplies needed for the hospitals. Outside of work for the hospitals, Cohen also went about giving food and clothing to those who had lost their homes, and in many cases, their family members. Although the need for food, medicine, and clothing were severe, the greatest challenge facing Rabbi Cohen and the city initially was the unprecedented death toll to what to do with the bodies. Throughout Galveston, men and women stepped from their homes to find corpses at their doorsteps. Even over a week later, bodies were still appearing. On September 19th alone, 273 bodies were found. The mayor and others feared a potential outbreak of yellow fever or other diseases which would spread if the dead were not buried post-haste. Thus, there is a serious need for cremation. Even though cremation is against Jewish and Catholic traditions, Father Kerwin, the leader of the Archdiocese, and Rabbi Cohen both gave their permissions for bodies to be cremated when necessary. Cohen's traumatic experience during and in the aftermath of the hurricane, in addition to the shrinking size of Galveston, could very well have prompted him to leave. It was as, not as if his services were not often requested by congregations around the country, Rabbi Stephen Wise asked Cohen time and again to move to New York to become a leader of a congregation and the reform movement there. However, whenever Cohen was asked following the hurricane if he would relocate to the Northeast, he said, no, I have enjoyed the prosperity of my people. I cannot now forsake them to their poverty. Rabbi Cohen was devoted to his community, body, and soul, and he would not abandon them in their time of need. He would serve them long after the debris was collected and the city was back on its feet. Years later, Cohen recalled the storm in a poem written 18, later, 18 years later titled, O Galveston. O Galveston, I sing not of material things that make our city, things that nature for us wrought, in years ago that still with us abide, the harbor bay and headlands, the flowering oleander and salt cedar, child of weed, gulf, and sandy waste, nor doth my muse chant later boons. Seeing their birth, oops, sorry, I, I scrolled down too much. Seeing that their birth was caused by storm and stress, the toll of angry waves. The hurricane of 1900 would remain with Rabbi Cohen for the rest of his life. However, in this poem, he expressed both the destruction wrought by the waves and the later boons improvements made by the city that could only have occurred following the storm. 18 years later, Galveston remained Henry Cohen's home, and like it, he too had been shaped by the wind and the waves, by the storm and stress, and like the city of Galveston, he remained. In studying how our forebears utilized their power and authority to provide immediate physical, emotional, theological, institutional, and financial relief to their congregants and broader communities, we can develop useful models of leadership that can, be hope, that can hopefully be applied in our own time and into the future. Jacob Borsinger and Henry Cohen provide 21st century rabbis with a broad picture of how the role of the American rabbi in response to epidemics and natural disasters has and will continue to shift over time. As clergy and as lay leaders, we can emulate Borsinger and Cohen by being adaptable and resilient and thinking beyond what our current roles entail. 
Throughout this crisis, we will be faced like they were, the challenges of providing pastoral care, fundraising to support our congregations and communities in need, and while serving as organizational and civic leaders. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, it's really, uh, it's unbelievable to me how much learning we managed to squeeze into one hour. Uh, uh, I, I want to, again, take this opportunity to thank Rabbis Sussman and Romano, and of course, to all of you who are in this webinar for your participation in the AJA's educational offering. It's been pointed out that every, uh, almost all of us in America have been suffering from what we call Zoom fatigue. And we are very grateful that you have made time to participate in these special study sessions. Once again, I wanna remind you that a recording of today's webinar and of the previous webinars uh, will be found on HUCJR's special learning portal, uh, huc.edu backslash online learning, where you'll be able to find an array of AJA and HUC learning opportunities. By the way, friends, remember May is Jewish American Heritage Month, and you will find our government's special Jewish American Heritage website on the front page of the American Jewish Archives webpage. So go there and enjoy. Uh, the AJA will definitely be hosting additional webinars of this sort in coming weeks. And we will be sending out invitations to participate via email. So keep your eye peeled for those announcements. Uh, once again, the few questions that some of you have posed, we'll send on to Rabbi Romano and Rabbi Sussman but we wanted to use all our time to absorb and to learn from their uh, wealth of knowledge. Finally, let me close our seminar by thanking once again, our two teachers, Rabbi Sussman, Rabbi Romano, and of course, the amazing staff and administration of the American Jewish Archives. A special word of gratitude goes, as Rabbi Sussman said at the beginning, to the redoubtable Lisa Frankel, who for 36 years has been my partner in crime here at HUC. And her capable contributions to the AJA defy enumeration. So thank you all very much. I wish everyone well. Shalom. Goodbye. Stay safe. Stay well. And of course, to all of you, please stay in touch. Thank you.